starts with me, it starts with you, right? That's where it starts. But how? So I've been on a journey for a bit of time lately, um, and I would like to share with you some things that I've been learning um, along this journey. And it starts with an encounter with God. So God's encounter with us started even before we were aware. Right? God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5 that I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I knew you before I formed you. God has a plan for each of us. Because God says later in Jeremiah to him, in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. He knows the plans that he has for us. So I did pray a few minutes ago that I wasn't going to go on a tangent, but this is a planned tangent <laughs> that I'm going on. See, I love the Old Testament. I love to dig into the Old Testament. And when I was completing my post-secondary schooling, which maybe a lot of you don't know, but I did go, a lot of you know that I do uh, psychotherapy, counseling and stuff. But when I was completing it, a large part of my studies, because I went to private schools, was biblical and theological studies. So I had six years at a bachelor's level, or three years at a bachelor, but three years at a master's level. And that, but I still remember my, my Old Testament professor from my undergrad, Professor John. And when he taught the Old Testament, it gave me goosebumps. He just embodied it, he lived it, he could present it, he could bring it to life. He had such power and conviction. And we need to know and understand the Old Testament in order to fully understand and experience the power of the New Testament and what Christ has done for us. So just a little bit of background, a bit about Jeremiah. He was a priest and a prophet. He came from a priestly family. His dad was a priest, family, brothers, and that they, he was raised in that priest tradition from the territory of Benjamin, which is where the Levites came from. And of course, Jeremiah is known mainly as a prophet, and he's quite often referred to as the weeping prophet, right? He wrote the book of Jeremiah. He wrote the book of Lamentations. So Jeremiah started prophesying in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah in Judah. And Jeremiah was called to the people to come and call the people out on their false and insecure worship of Yahweh and their failure to trust Yahweh, including in their national affairs. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> History repeating itself? Jeremiah was to prepare the people for their exile and captivity to Babylon, which is then what we see through the book of Daniel. And it all began with Jeremiah having an encounter with God. And I will come back to that in a bit. So on my journey, I have been, over this last several months to a year in my own life, been experiencing some oppression. And I can't share all of that detail right now, but I do believe that when God has brought me through, that there is going to be a powerful testimony when his work is complete. And then maybe, hopefully, I will be able to share it at one of Jim's praise and testimony nights. So that's my, <laughs> that's my hope. <laughs> So today, though, my focus is on having an encounter with God. I believe each person here today has had at least one encounter. And that would have been at your time of salvation. Coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and entering into his forgiveness. An encounter that changes us. But our encounters with God cannot and should not stop there. If you think of your earthly relationships, right, the important relationships that we have, if you just had that initial encounter and never met again, 
it wouldn't be much of a relationship. It wouldn't be intimate. It wouldn't be deep, right? It was not a once a encounter. For them to impact us, us to impact them, it needs to be encounter, encounter, and deep encounters, heart to heart. And how much more does God long for us to have these deep encounters with him and for him to have that with us, right? He knew us before we were created in our mother's womb. He longs for that deep encounter. So I did go and I did look up a couple definitions of encounters. And these are the two that I found. Um, so to come up or meet with, especially unexpectedly, to come upon, sorry, to come upon or meet with, especially unexpectedly. And the second one is an encounter is a meeting or a moment when something happens. However, with an encounter, something, sorry, an experience, I mistyped that, an experience is a meeting or a moment when something happens. However, with an encounter, something unexpectedly new happens. Something unexpectedly new happens when you have an encounter. An encounter is not surface level. It touches us to the core. It can rock us. It can shake us up a bit, or maybe a whole lot. God invites us, longs for us to seek him, to have that deep encounter to the core with him, aligning ourselves to his plan. So the very first verse that I memorized as a child was Matthew 7.7. 7. I don't know what I memorized it for, but it was something, and that was the very first one, and I repeated that time and time and time again. I don't know, it could have been for a salty play, I don't know. It was for something, though. And it always stuck with me that this is the very first verse out of the Bible that I committed to memory. And so I'm going to say that one, and then I'm going to continue on to verse 11 out of Matthew 7. And it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and and it shall be open to you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh the door shall be open. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So let's reflect, reflect back to what he tells Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. For good, not disaster. A future. A hope. So how often do we want to follow our own plans, right? We come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, and then we still want to do it our way. He wants to give us the best. And as stated in Matthew, all we need to do is ask, seek, and knock. Long for, press in for that encounter with God. So quite often we think, I've said the sinner's prayer, I go to church weekly, I tithe, right? And then we think to ourselves, that's good. But if that is where we remain, then we are missing out on so much more. So Matthew 6, 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? And then we go back to Matthew 7, or move on into Matthew 7. And if a child asks for something, would you give him or her something of no use? Would you give them something that would bring harm? No, you wouldn't. So why do we think that God would, and this is me included, 
Why would we think that God would give us something other than the best? He wants the best for us. He has the best for us. I know the plans I have for you. They are good. He has a future and a hope for us. So by continuing in our own life plans and choices, we are communicating that we can do it better. Can we trust what God has said in his word? Do we trust what God says? So last week our speaker touched on why do we go through difficult times? And it's interesting because, you know, I've been listening to Pastor Lisa and then I listened to the pastor and I already had my sermon kind of, you know, in progress and, you know, hearing him speak and just kind of hearing how it just all kind of aligns, it all kind of comes together, right? You know, and so he said last week, you know, why do we go through difficult times? Why do we go through adversities? Why do we go through the valleys? And he says, sometimes it's a natural consequence to our choices. And I agree. Sometimes it is a natural but sometimes it's to get our attention, to get us back with God, to bring us back, to move us into an encounter with him so that we will have a testimony. See, God sent Jeremiah to prepare the people of Judah for exile and for captivity. God didn't leave them, but they had left him. They had wandered so far away from the time that they came out of Egypt and went through the wilderness and possessed the promised land. They had moved so far away. And he had sent Jeremiah, and, and this was to bring them back. He did not leave them. But they had, they had wandered in their worship. They had wandered away in their trust of Yahweh, the, that God was using this to bring his people back to him so that then they could move forward in the plans, in the future, in the goodness, in the hope, that he had for them, which is above anything that we can dream of for ourselves, that they could dream of for them. And so as we come through it, we have an encounter with God. And when we have that encounter with God, then we have a powerful testimony. And then we can't keep it to ourselves, right? We are so filled when we have that encounter that then it just naturally overflows and it just floods out. It starts to affect the people around us. And that is how an encounter with God can lead to a revival. We overflow. We share our testimony of what God has done, what he is doing. You know, and when we look back through the Old Testament, a lot of times that the festivals were instituted, it was so that, because God wanted them to remember. You know, God wanted them to remember how he brought them out, right? The Passover feast, it was because they put the blood on the doorpost and the angel of death passed over. He wanted the people to remember, to have that testimony of what God has done for them. And so lots of times that's why those things were instituted, so that they would remember. They could share in the testimony for the generations to t come. How he's been faithful, the amazing plans, the future, the hope. And that is why it is the Old Testament, the New Testament. It is the testifying of God and his mighty power, his grace and his mercy. Testifying is so powerful that it's what is recorded in Revelation. So in Revelation 12, 11, it states, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives unto, not their lives unto death. Right? And so who's, who is him? It's the enemy. Right? How was the enemy defeated? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And all of that is written in scripture. All that has been testified of those that have gone on before us, right? Our testimony added to that and those to come. It is only because of God's plan of redemption through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have a testimony. It is only through that 
that revival can come. So we need to get it into our spirit that we can trust God with every part, every aspect of our being, and that we become less and he becomes more. Greater in our lives. And the only way that is going to happen is if we have an encounter with God. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He is calling us out not to be conformed to this world. We need to set time aside, a lot of time, reading the scripture, praying, seeking God, only putting godly things in, right? There was a pastor, was it Smith Wigglesworth? Like never read a newspaper, never had a TV, right? Like he just, all he did was read the word of God. He just read and read and read and he didn't put in any of that stuff hmm oh lester summer i i knew it was one of them so you know and it just and that and and so close of a walk you know to god right we don't want to be the church of laodicea and it's funny that he mentioned that last week because i already <laughs> i already have that we don't want to be the church of laodicea because as recorded in the book of Revelation, right, if we are lukewarm, if we try to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, what's he going to do? He's going to spew us out of his mouth, right? And so we can't. It is time for us to get on fire for God, to be separate from this world. And that's what an encounter with God will do. Now, you might have lots of excuses, that why God can't use you, he's heard every one of them, every one. Even Rod Boyce wrote a song about excuses, excuses. He hears them every day, right? And that, and so, but we need to know that, you know, the excuses don't hold up, right? Think of Moses, right? Moses said, oh, I'm slow to speak. I'm slow in tongue. Don't use me. But then when he got there, how much speaking did Aaron actually do for Moses, <laughs> right? God used him, right? Going back to Jeremiah and having that encounter with God, right? Jeremiah actually saying, I'm too young, Lord. I can't do this. God said, nope, I'm using you. And once we have that encounter with God, watch out, right? Look at what happens in scriptures, right? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had that encounter, what happened in that whole kingdom of exile, right? When Daniel came out of the lion's den, what happened in that whole country of exile, right? The king had not, could do nothing except say, God is the almighty God. He is. He is the true God. And then we see it at the woman in the well, right? When Jesus met with her and had an encounter with the woman at the well, you know, and what happened there when she went back to the village, right? the least likely person, because back then, you know, women were not seen as, you know, those to bring forward. But God chose her, had an encounter with her, and she went back to the village and look at what happened with his disciples, right? Second Corinthians 12, 19 says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Wow. So I guess there is no excuse right? There is no excuse, right? It is God working in and through us. It is not our strength. Even me standing up here speaking today, right? I can't do it in myself. It is him working through me. And so we need to remember that. And even people in this room can give testimony to their encounter with God. You know, Dad has talked about his encounter when he's down at rehab and the angel being there, right? When you walk away from that, you're changed. You can't be the same. You know, I know Phil has spent, shared many a times his encounters, right? Who here could give a testimony of an encounter with God? Raise your hand, right? We all have a testimony. We, and it's all started with an encounter with God 
something new happens, right? Don't just let it be when you come to salvation. You need to seek that encounter after salvation. You need to seek that encounter continuously. Because Jesus is coming back real soon. Right? There is an urgency. We need to get real with God. We have to get serious about our relationship with Jesus. We need to press in to have an encounter with God. And if you do, you won't be disappointed. So don't be content where you are. Long for more. Ask, seek, knock, trust. He is right here. He wants the best for you. He wants the best for me. He wants the best for all mankind, everyone that he's created. So we need to be filled to overflowing so that we can share with other people, that when they come in contact with us, they know, just like when I sat there and listened to that Indigenous elder, right? They know it's genuine. We don't have to be harsh in our presentation. We don't have to be pushy. It just needs to flow out of us. We need to have that encounter. So since I've started to press in, God is right there. He's there in his scripture. He's there hearing my prayers. You know, and he is, through this, given me other pieces. You know, I've watched up to now the series, The Chosen. I don't know if any of you have watched that, you know. But it has just shed such a different light on it, you know, of how Jesus walked on the earth. I've also come into a contact with another one called Encounter um, on Pure Flix. And again, it's just how Jesus is there to meet us in the moment, to have that encounter. You know, my radio pretty much stays on KFM. Zacharias can tell you the two, the two stations from North Bay to Sundridge. Because that's where my radio stays, right? Just pouring more of him in my life learning to deepen my personal relationship, learning how to trust him more, the plans that he has, right? So in closing, I'd like to read this to you. Um, I can't take credit for this. Um, I heard it along the way, and when I heard it, I knew I wanted to share it, so I wrote it down. So these are not necessarily my words, but I do believe that they are God's words. So I just invite you for a moment, if you feel comfortable, just to close your eyes and just listen to these words as I read them. Just let them fall. How we see ourselves is not how God sees us. We are made in the image of our Heavenly Father. Before we were born, He knew every day of our lives. He finds joy in us. The hard times need not be wasted, but an opportunity for us to grow. As Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us de develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. The hard times need not be wasted, but an opportunity for us to grow. We need to use them to make us the beautiful, caring, kind-hearted person that he created us to be that we are, we are his perfect creation and absolutely loved beyond any love on this earth. Sins are washed away, white as snow, holy, without blemish, without a spot, 
without a wrinkle. And that's how our Heavenly Father sees us. He hears our prayers. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He took the punishment for us at the cross. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you want an encounter with God? Because he wants one with you. If you do, tell him. Worship him as we play this song. It is called Encounter. And if you do want prayer, come forward. We will pray with you. If you just want to spend your time and worship him, but just let these words of the song fall upon your spirit today. And I just invite you to start that encounter with God this very day.